Uh, thank you all for coming today, and I want to thank uh, Cloudera for inviting us to be a part of this. We're just going to speak on stage for a few minutes, and then we want to throw the lights up and hear from you because we have some experts here uh, on the subject matter. Um, they, I mean, you, you will have better questions than I will, I'm sure, so mm -hmm. I will look forward to that. Um, a couple of the topics that I want to hit on. The most important thing that I continue to hear uh, from agency people in the federal government, at least, about data is the avalanche of it, how to deal with the quantity of it, and how to understand the quality of it, uh, whether what you're looking at is any good before you start to ask it questions. Um, Lori Walsh from the SEC, I'll start with you. How are you managing those two important parts of data at your agency? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, a lot of people think, oh, we don't have enough data. And I was like, no, we have way <laughs> too much data. We don't even know where to begin to, to use it. And so um, a, a big part of what um, my group and, and others like us at the agency, um, the quantitative groups at the agency, is we try to figure out, OK, what's the data like? What, what do we think we can get from this data? You evaluate the quality. You evaluate the consistency, you know, overall like data quality checks and say, what do we think we can get out of it? What tools do we need to get that information out? It's always about um, really gleaning like the, the key insights from the data and can we do it and how do we do it? Steve, you're experiencing the same thing, an avalanche of information coming in and trying to look at it from both of those perspectives. Yeah, I think from our perspective, it's we're really looking at how we can help the industry deal with it from a healthcare perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking at both the healthcare providers that are treating patients and getting a lot of data in relative to their care, as well as um, new types of technologies like wearables and other types of devices that now, you know, us as patients are bringing to our healthcare providers and how they handle uh, that avalanche, so to speak, in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Audi Hiddle of EMC, um, the customers that come to you in the federal government ask you questions. What are they asking you beyond uh, handling the quantity and understanding the quality of it? I guess beyond the, the quantity and quality, it's, it's really dealing with, uh, you know, how to uh, provide access to the data uh, from both the, uh, I'll say, the remote or the tactical edge and also uh, the data in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for solutions in those in that space, you know, both from the data center to the edge to the cloud type of environments. Is, is the understanding about cloud getting better than it had, say, if we went back two years ago? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. How is it getting better? What are, are people asking different questions or smarter questions, understanding without having to ask as many questions, or what's the difference? I think the difference is uh, definitely just the maturity, you know, the, the concepts are better understood now, but also the technology is better understood. They're appreciating the, they're appreciating the differences uh, in uh, the options available, they're appreciating, appreciating the differences in, in terms of um, the costs and the benefits of going to the cloud. and. That wasn't really that well understood a couple years ago. People talked a couple years ago about going to the cloud as if they could just somehow uh, solve their uh, ownership, stewardship, management, and cost problems just by dumping the data off to the cloud and it was once and done. Mm -hmm. And now they, they really have come to understand that's not the situation. It's not a destination, it's a vehicle to get to a destination. Right. Yeah, You're, both our government people are shaking their heads in <laughs> agreement with that. What's making the difference, do you think, in understanding the cloud better? Not so much in the IT areas, because I think the IT people have gotten it for a while, but in the other, among the other stakeholders that are involved. Um, I would say at the at the SEC, um, I, I think the the business leaders have gotten a deeper understanding of it because, really, uh, you know, the funding to get new storage like physical storage, uh, new processing capacity, it, it, gets, it, it comes to them. So, um, you know, the, the uh, managing executive of the division enforcement has to ask our Office of Information Technology every year for a budget to do these things. And we have to ask for, you know, extra physical hardware to store data and analytical tools to analyze data. And, and so I think now it's kind of, um, making them look more closely at alternative options and thinking about could we save money um, you know, by, or could we, could we get something more out of the money that we're spending? Um, mm -hmm. 
So that's Steve? how we're looking yeah, at it. Yeah, I would add in, uh, I think in, in the world that I work in, it's, it's really about scale and efficiency and how um, you can approach uh, using cloud infrastructure in a way that can enable healthcare providers to be more efficient, to have the software be deployed in a more um, efficient manner, and to also uh, find ways to push knowledge and information to the broadest community possible in the least amount of time. Mm -hmm. Chuck, so, yeah. I just wanted to mention, David. as a counterpoint to that, you know, I work in the security space, and we've had customers try to put their security monitoring services in the cloud and have actually clawed that back and brought it back in house. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the, one of the things the cloud does is it has to offer a very consistent single type of service, and often the business needs are more complex than a single offering can provide. Mm -hmm. So there's always this counterbalancing of, oh, yes, it's easier and cheaper potentially, but maybe they're not going to quite meet your needs, and how do you get that extra mile? So I've seen hybrid models. I've seen put it all in the cloud. I've also seen we're going to keep it in-house because we can't. it doesn't quite meet our needs. And, and I think it, no matter what you do, whether you have your data on bare metal or you do push it to the cloud, you still have all the challenges that Laurie mentioned early on, uh, data quality, you know, it, Every, all data is pretty much dirty, mm. and there's just varying degrees of that, and you have to be able to work through that. You still need those analytical tools, whether they're in your in-house system or up in the cloud, you still need that capability. So determining whether you should go or not go, obviously that's involved in, in the business case that you build when you're deciding to make the transition. What, are, what do you think some of the people who have moved to the cloud, moved applications to the cloud, and then pulled them back missed in their business cases that caused them to get into that situation? Well, it comes down to understanding the business. So, you know, when you try to get an external provider to monitor your environment for security concerns, they don't necessarily know what your most valuable assets are. They don't know your people. They don't necessarily know the best way to escalate when issues come up. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding how moving things in the cloud is, go is going to impact your incident response processes and other business processes, which is hard to evaluate up front because all of these things are tribal knowledge and not documented anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what they have found is that as they push things to the cloud, the simplistic cloud offering that they bought off on didn't provide as much flexibility as maybe was promised originally. Uh -huh. yeah. so. so is it then sometimes a case of cloud being wrong or the wrong cloud solution was what they wound up with? Audie? Well, just to build kind of on that thought too, uh, the word hybrid was mentioned and, and what I'm seeing is a, a lot of a couple of years ago, a lot of people are thinking they could just kind of go to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And what they're discovering is, well, it's really more of a combination of hybrid in the sense of some on-premise, some off-premise cloud environment. So kind of on-prem, off-prem cloud capabilities uh, in that sense. So it's not a right or wrong, it's a mix of this hybrid on-prem, off-prem environment that they're discovering best meets their needs. And, and you also have a, a lot of variations of the cloud. You can have more of the commercial cloud. You go to Amazon, you know, that's the commercial cloud. You can also have your private cloud, um, still running it in a virtualized environment, which helps a lot with the security issues. Um, to your point earlier, I think there are kind of three main factors that everybody looks at. Everybody looks at cost. Oh, it looks cheaper on paper. Mm -hmm. But you also have to take into account privacy and then the security aspects of it because there's certain data you may not be able to put out in the cloud. You may want to keep that internal, and then you look lean towards a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> potentially one of the things then that's here, I'm going to kind of go back to what you were talking about a minute ago, Audi, is there's a complexity here that I think a lot of folks didn't think about or didn't anticipate when the whole cloud phenomenon first started. We're going to move to the cloud, and that's going to be it. And with the various flavors, and with the various considerations in uh, business cases, it's not automatic necessarily, and it's not, um, it's not simple. There's, there's a lot to consider before you do it. It sounds like our government folks did those kind of very complex uh, business cases and arguments. Like you knew what you were getting into, it sounds like, from the way you've described it so far. Just to be clear, the SEC has not gone to the cloud. Okay. <laughs> um, we are engaging in, uh, like we're engaging in discussions um, and, um, and, and trying to balance the, the, the things that were mentioned earlier, the security um, versus the, the cost. And, uh, you know, especially in enforcement, we've got a lot of very sensitive data. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, we're still working through those 
issues and considerations. So are all these kinds of issues and questions that we've talked about the kinds of things that you're looking at right now? Yes, yes, exactly. And I think it's just overall important to note that one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. You know, every agency might be a little different mm -hmm. um, and every company is going to be a little different and that's where you really have to understand what your requirements are, what's your use case, what are you trying to accomplish. So requirements, uh, we come back to this on all kinds of acquisitions all throughout the government, is what do I need it to do? And we seem to get stuck on that. I mean, whether it's an airplane or uh, some kind of data requirement. I, I think a lot of times, you know, you jump into requirements and you focus on the user requirements, what you need that system to do. And as a second thought, we look at the security and we look at the privacy. I think you need to pull them in up front. And as soon as you pull them in, you can better understand, well, can I even put this data there? That should be the first question before mm -hmm. you even figure out the user wants this type of interface. Um, so I think privacy and security requirements are should be very important to everybody. Chuck Lewis of MITRE is sitting right next to me, and I apologize because okay. I talk with my hands. And so at some point, if I <laughs> invade your personal space, I apologize for that. One of the things that you've been working on is uh, social media analytics. Yes. How are agencies using social media analytics to their benefit? So I, I think it's kind of a part of a screening and vetting uh, process. Um, everybody knows, um, you know, the San Bernardino shooting in California, a very horrible event. Um, a lot of information came out about that as far as what was on social media, what people saw. Um, there was a lot of questions of should we have known, should we have seen it. Um, I think if, if you read more into what's out there publicly, um, you'll see a lot of the information was marked as private, so you don't necessarily have open access to that. So um, I think it's important to use big data technologies to essentially reduce the haystack so you can make better informed decisions down the road. Um, it, it's, it's a vastly changing environment. Um, I mean, it, it's almost like a new language, too. I mean, you have people, you know, doing emojis, and, you know, that's not text. How do, how do I look that up? Mm -hmm. People sending images. So you have challenges with recognizing certain images and figuring out, well, where was that picture taken? Um, so it's a whole new world that's just rapidly evolving, and every teenager, high school, middle school kid has a phone almost now, and they're posting billions of tweets a day. Uh, Facebook is exploding, and you're trying to sift through that data to find that needle in the haystack, and it's extremely hard. What are the, what's kind of the next step? We can talk about state of the art. A lot of people talk about state of the art in data analytics. What's the next step that people will want and what's the next step that people should want? Because it's not always necessarily the same thing. So I think a lot of what you see is really driven by industry. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of in Silicon Valley and, and up at you know, MIT and things like that. That's where you're starting to see the new venture capital companies spin up and they're going for that leading edge. I think the next big thing is the machine learning and deep learning. Um, that is probably you know, two, three, four, five years out. But that's going to be the next big cycle we're going to see, which I personally think is going to help greatly with some of the big data. Audie and David, I want to give you guys a chance to answer that question too. But your customers, essentially, uh, in this area, what's maybe the next iteration or the iteration after that that you would find useful for data analytics? You want to go first, Stephen? Sure, sure. Uh, I think in our industry, in the healthcare sector, we're looking at a convergence of many different data sources that have not necessarily streamed together. So when we're looking at claims data, the, health, the data generated as part of clinical treatment as well as now data that patients may provide as well, um, merging all that together to perform predictive analytics and, and other types of techniques that can help uh, look forward into the future to say this patient's going to go off their medication or some, things along that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think for the SEC, we're at a good point of bringing all our data together, which is one of the cloud issues. If part of our data is in the cloud and part of it's not, how do you bring it together? Mm -hmm. um, but I think beyond that, um, we have a tremendous amount of unstructured data, uh, you know, subpoena data, documents. And, um, and so really, like natural language tools, entity extraction tools are like what summarizing the content of various documents in a way that makes it easy to really focus in on what should I be looking at of you know the production of a million documents I can't look at a million documents which one should I be looking at and so I think that's really where particularly for the division of enforcement also for our exam program and such like that's a big um, that's it's a big next step for us that we're that we're really um, looking to go and to. And about those kinds of tools before I get to you guys 
is thinking about those tools that you will want, even if they don't necessarily exist yet, is that instructive as to how you think about, in your case, how you transition to the cloud to make sure you're prepared for whatever comes down the line? Uh, yeah, so you know, I think one of the things that we're doing is um, mini tests in house using our own tools. You know, we've got our own programmers and stuff, and so we're using a number of different tools to say, okay, what can we do with this? What can we do with this to create test cases? So then we can say, okay, now we have a set of good test cases. Um, let's go out and see if we can find something that can serve those test cases um, for us, and you know, that would include storage and access and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think we look at it from a technology policy perspective. I like to put a hyphen between those two words. In, in terms of, obviously, healthcare is a, I would say, heavily regulated environment. But um, as we look to seeing what the art of the possible is in terms of how we want to <coughs> evolve the regulatory structures that exist for healthcare providers and how they get paid, understanding the types of tools that may be available to them to then meet the demand from a data perspective is, is important for us to reality check what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sorry, can I just Please. jump in real quick? I just want Absolutely. to add um, one of the things that the reason why we're doing a lot of in house testing is um, you know, you see a neat tool and you think, oh, that's really great. I wonder how I could use that. And that's the wrong direction to be going. And mm -hmm. so one of the things we really try hard to do is say, okay, what are the, what's the capability we need? What are the steps in the process that we need? Um, and then go out and look for the tool rather than the other way around. So maybe the tools, Audi, that the uh, that customers like these will want or should want, maybe I'm coming at it from the wrong direction. Well, I don't know. I'm thinking of it in terms of the maybe the the, the actual sort of definition of innovation, which is um, the application of the technology and not the invention of the future technology. A lot of things on the horizon, you know, but, but I think one of the next big things is the innovation and the application of some of the, some of the current breakthroughs that we've had and some of the, the technologies that exist today. Some of the agencies have and are, and are starting to explore and apply. Um, and things like, uh, conceptually things like uh, the data lake, which addresses some of the challenges we were talking about earlier um, and, you know, prior to coming out about being able to bring together, you know, break down the silos of data and bring together, you know, multiple types of sources um, through, you know, multiple access, uh, you know, <clears throat> protocols and into an environment uh, where you can conduct, you know, big data analytics across the enterprise, you know, regardless of the type of data, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, unstructured, structured data, looking across all of that, uh, I think that would lead to a, a tremendous breakthrough and a real return on investment, you know, and lead to a true, you know, innovation, if you will, <coughs> that would help that agency and others really begin to appreciate the value of those investments and lead to other innovations relative to the application of that type of technology. And uh, uh, other innovations leveraging uh, technologies which, uh, you know, the concept of the data lake has been out there for a few years, but other technologies have just recently been introduced. A new technology that's literally just come out uh, a couple weeks ago, just been uh, formally uh, available, for instance, this week, a new technology called Rack Scale Flash. Uh, and this is something which is a, a, a true innovation in the industry, which combines uh, networked shared storage with direct attached storage uh, in a, in a single environment, you know, enabling you to conduct uh, analytics on uh, streaming data, uh, real-time analytics, as well as uh, analytics uh, across larger, you know, um, groups of Hadoop big data and so forth. And and I think that's going to lead to uh, tremendous innovations in the industry that, uh, in many cases, perhaps yet untold because we haven't had the opportunity to innovate in that environment yet. So. Uh, big things uh, expected in that area. David, I'll give you one more moment to get your answer together. Uh, and then we're going to come to you and see what questions you have for anybody on the panel here. Um, we have, uh, do we have microphones that will go around? Um, we'll take those, start taking those in just a moment. David, what do you see uh, that uh, data consumers and users should be thinking about in the coming generation, maybe after uh, what's right on the horizon? 
Sure. Well, so in my space, you know, again, security, if you think of all the pro most of the products on the market, they tend to be very closed systems. You know, pulls data in, does some kind of analytics on it, and produces a result, a detected threat or something like that. And, and that needs to change. And the whole concept that these folks are talking about with the data lake and bringing data into a single place, that's where we're seeing the benefits of innovation is pulling all the data and hopefully storing it, presenting it in standardized ways, not proprietary ways. Um, because that also helps with future proofing. Right? So now I, I buy a tool today because it meets my needs, but tomorrow I want to replace it. I can still use the same data structures. I don't need to custom build a transformation or anything like that. So we're trying to evolve that with our own product set, but also incorporating, hopefully, third-party products as well. All right. Um, we have um, about 15 minutes or so to hear from you. So uh, I need these, unfortunately, to be able to see the audience. I have a question. Hi, folks up there. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, a question for any of you, but especially Stephen. Uh, there's a lot of concern about security and healthcare and technology. Uh, there was an article just yesterday about ambulances being vulnerable. They have so much IT in them, they're all connected. Uh, they have important critical information you need to get to the ambulance. It's vulnerable to hacking and intrusion. And then the information they send to the emergency room, vulnerable to intercept and hacking and intrusion. What can you do to save us from this? But if any of you have a comment on that. <laughs> you well, personally, and, and it's personally not just relevant that. to healthcare data. Um, I did an interview on my program this past weekend with a Navy admiral whose team is building a virtual ship because every aspect of a ship's operation or a sub's operation mm -hmm. is controlled by the network and ascertaining that when the rudder is supposed to move 10 degrees one direction, it actually moves 10 degrees one direction and, and hasn't been hacked is, is obviously very important. So it's not just healthcare, it's all, it's every, everything. Yeah, um, that's why I work for the government. <laughs> um, I, and all of us have Superman you know, shirts underneath our, our uh, dress shirts. I, I think you know, those are the types of issues that are a principal concern to us as we look at policy approaches and working across the department. Um, I also, you know, we work with colleagues in the FDA that deal with medical devices, right? So these are types of issues that can capture the imagination when you look at the, um, the kind of articles related to hacking and the approaches that are, are ongoing and testing and trying to kind of probe the areas of weakness in this industry. Um, you know, it, it, strikes fear in people's hearts literally when you have a pacemaker and then it's there's some type of vulnerability associated with that as you look to uh, you know wireless upgrades and the like so there's a lot of work that our FDA colleagues have been doing they've been putting out cybersecurity related guidance um, there's a new um, advisory committee that's going on throughout the department as a result of the the recent cybersecurity legislation so we're also looking across uh, HHS as well in terms of information sharing opportunities uh, relative to cyber threats and the like. So it's very top of mind from an administration perspective. It, that's a, it was a great question. I'm actually a volunteer firefighter and medic in um, Howard County in Maryland. And um, you, you bring up a valid concern. Some of the um, challenges that we're faced with is every, every jurisdiction is a little different. Um, a lot of the, the tools that I know the fire departments use are COTS products. Um, but a lot of times you're, you're getting money from local governments or tax dollars or, you know, you're volunteer, you're getting contributions. So you're forced to make trade-offs, unfortunately, but that's what it comes down to. Do I buy a new fire engine or do I buy this new software package because it has better <coughs> encryption? And undoubtedly, you always get the new fire engine because that's really cool. Um, and, and a lot of people don't understand the security aspects. I know at least in our county, um, the data is encrypted, um, so I do feel a little bit secure about that. But you're right, the, the ambulance is actually a mobile hotspot. Um, and I mean, you can hack just like a house, you could hack that. So um, I, I think it's, it's a delay in that the, some of the technologies are there, it's just gotta start to filter down. Um, I mean, some of these places, whether you're in know, rural counties and stuff like that, your, your equipment's 10, 15 years old. Um, so, you know, th there's a lot of issues that, you know, it's not just the security piece, it's how do I pay for it? I'm sure everybody would love to have the most secure transmission, so if I send something to a hospital, it, it's secure, but it, it's funding um, is it, a huge, huge challenge in that area. Well, I think it, I think it is, uh, you know, not just the technology, too. And I think, uh, in general, the technology is there mm -hmm. to support a lot of these. The funding is a challenge. But I think a lot of it is the people, too, and the culture, and getting the people trained and, you know, uh, wanting to adopt or apply the technology and actually use the technology that's there on a consistent and, and regular basis as well. So 
knowing that's there and actually, you know, properly using it uh, are two different things. And uh, you know, in some cases, the cultures have to be changed to acknowledge that that threat and that risk. And that doesn't always exist, especially in some of the more you know rural areas that uh, that may be you know uh, hacked more easily. Jump in. Um, back, so, at, you know, at the SEC, we're really worried about this as well because um, a hacked Twitter account uh, can affect, you know, stock prices, financial markets, like drastically, as we as we know from experience. And so, we're really focused on this issue as well. We're working closely with Department of Justice and Department of Defense to to try to find ways to um, identify a a fraudulent announcement, posting, whatever, as quickly as possible so that we can turn around and say, no, it's you know, not real, and the financial markets can rebound more quickly. Um, you know, up to this point has been you know, mostly company specific or, or fairly small types of hacks that um, bad information has come out about, but you know, it, it's always an issue in our mind. Electronic currencies are another big one where we worry about, um, about cybersecurity and about security of the data in electronic currency trading. And, and, and things like that. So I know the SEC is, is focused on that as well. David? Yeah, so we're getting into the <coughs> Internet of Things space a little bit mm -hmm. here. And I say there's a huge problem in the industry where not enough attention is being paid to the security of those devices. There was a case where the body cams the police officers wear shipped with malware already in the software, <laughs> <laughs> like right out of the factory. Um, so that's a, a, something we just need to address. I mean, vendors making equipment like this need to pay much more attention to their supply chain and make sure that their equipment is much more secure. Uh, but that said, if history has taught us anything, no system is 100% secure. And so monitoring and mitigation controls and, and manual overrides, all those aspects need to be rolled into the system in order to assure safety. But given uh, what you suggested uh, about the various jurisdictions, that means thousands and thousands and thousands of monitoring systems Absolutely. unless there's some kind of coalescence around standards and, and the, the standards you brought up is, is a huge point I mean um, I just know from personal experience you know you're trans transferring a patient to a hospital um, depending what conglomerate hospital that is they have different systems than, than the, the next one so um, having a standard interface for things like that it, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that leave you open then to the weaknesses of that standard? Absolutely. Absolutely. Other questions? I can't see very well from here. here. So right over here. I, d I do see you, sir. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Uh, here we go. There you go. Microphone right there. Yeah. Um, my team is currently engaged in uh, economic development um, using social media as a platform. Um, we operate in emerging and frontier markets, and now I'm back campaigning in the U.S. to promote our concept. It's called face economics. What's the evolution um, or the tendency uh, within this evolution, do you think, uh, that it will be applied in, in each government agency? My background is federal government, too. So uh, I'm just kind of curious to, you know, to know um, where do you see the social media platform um, in reference to the evolution and the use of this platform in economic development? Anyone can answer this question. So I'll take a stab first, Go and then it. if you guys want to chime in, feel yeah. free. Um, I, I think industry has been better at social media in terms of the marketing. Um, they do it extremely well. You talk to some of the big names on, you know, up in New York City and how they capture um, what you're searching for online and you know those little coupons pop up for the new pair of shoes or whatever it might be I mean that's no coincidence they know how to do that they know how to harvest information from Facebook and Twitter and things like that they do it extremely well um, I know at least at the Department of Homeland Security it's focused on making sure what people are doing online is not necessarily bad you know you're not saying bad things that alone presents a challenge you'll get people you know, posting, oh, that Subway sandwich was the bomb. Well, okay, that means a good thing, it's not a bad thing. Um, so there's definite challenges. As far as economic growth, um, I don't know if you guys do any more with that than we. We don't do too much as far as, you know, trying to build things. We're more of a consumer of it. More a regulator of it to the extent <laughs> that it has an effect on securities, um, securities laws. I, I, I guess I would say that 
um, you know, the SEC's regulations, uh, there's certain regulations that have come up, such as the Jobs Act, um, it's jumpstart our business startups. Um, the, the Jobs Act that um, loosens restrictions on communication with investors as long as they meet certain criteria and, and that would lend itself well to a social media kind of thing. Um, although we don't directly address social media, it's, you know, I, I think there is an understanding that social media is, is more of a, um, of a way of driving economic development. But SME development, like small, medium-sized enterprises that are just kind of you know, it, it just, just popped out of the door most of the time, you know, just have simultaneously. Thank okay. you. Um, are we competitive enough uh, as, a, as a country and as an economy uh, to cultivate that resource, in your opinion? I can't answer that. I, I'm not really an expert in that area. Thank you for the questions. Others? I don't know how you can see anybody. <laughs> well, and I have the dirtiest glasses in the room, I think, so I'm getting a little bit more glare. Um, so, we'll lob the mic up to the second level, right? Now. Oh, I think we have one. Thank you. So, I'm not sure. Uh, I think this probably for anybody on the panel, but uh, it, what is your sense as to the appreciation for risk and risk management? in making security decisions. Um, as a technologist, uh, a lot of times uh, what, what we're still seeing is a very reactive uh, approach uh, and labeling something as secure by just choosing a particular technology rather than uh, actually uh, using risk management techniques. So I was wondering what the evolution on using those techniques is in your opinion. I can address that. Go ahead. Um, it, it is a definite trend in the industry, and just as an example, uh, we, my company attends the Gartner Identity Access Management Conference every year, and uh, they historically have focused primarily on the operational aspects of you know, single sign-on and provisioning of, of user accounts and things like that. <clears throat> but this past year, well, I think almost half the presentations are about security. We're seeing more security influencers being involved in buying decisions. And that is definitely influencing how products are evaluated and selected for purchase. Uh, that doesn't necessarily address the risk management aspects of what you're talking about, but the, there is a growing awareness uh, within the customers that, that we come across uh, that they need to account for risk and, and applying security controls and things like that in anything they do, not just you know, what they're doing in their SOC, but everything they purchase, every tool they choose to deploy, whether it's cloud, hybrid, in, inside, you know, it doesn't matter. That is a definite trend, and I think that'll only accelerate. I think the most important thing, I'll, Audie, I'll come to you in a second. I think the most important thing you said there was that the security aspect of it is not the only kind of risk that people like Stephen and Lori are looking at. Is that, is that right? I mean, there's a, a long list, I imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, so it, there, there's a, a definite trade-off in, in risks that we face using enforcement data, very sensitive data, really valuable for analytics, um, but there's, you know, there are risks associated where um, obviously with, with somebody getting access to analyze a large amount of data and then like absconding or, you know, making that data public. Um, somebody breaking in, somebody leaving their laptop on, on the metro, that kind of thing. But there's also, there's also risks associated with um, our ability to get the information to begin with. And if we start using it, you know, it, it, it makes it harder for us to get the information in a way that's usable if, we, if the, you know, the companies that we're getting it from are worried about us losing the data. And, and uh, you know, if it's on a laptop, if it's, you know, if it's, um, it, electronic or, or whatnot versus paper. And so, you know, we definitely face trade-offs. I'm always more of the, you know, let's push forward and you know, forget about the risks. We need to do analytics. And mm -hmm. my boss is like, no, 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 we need to protect the data. <laughs> so Stephen, the sheep makes an interesting point is that the risk management and the risk awareness goes both directions mm -hmm. in an office like hers and also in an office like yours where you're exchanging information with very large uh, healthcare providers. Yeah, I mean, I think to your your point in question, um, there's education is something that we can't overemphasize enough, especially when you're talking about a very diverse healthcare provider um, 
uh, stakeholder spectrum from you know very large hospitals like a Johns Hopkins to a small doc practice in a rural area. Uh, they have very different um, abilities and resources able to, to put towards security. And doing a security risk analysis is one of the things that we talk to everybody you know, relative to their scale to, to look into. Um, but we've also had incidents you know, reported where um, you know, a healthcare provider will, will sign up for a uh, cloud service provide, uh, you know, software solution, and then they don't pay their bill, and then their data gets encrypted. Um, and kind of held it's ransomware. for, for, for you know, um, <laughs> and, and then you think about that healthcare provider, if you were to go to them, like they, they are dependent upon that software, you know, to treat you in essence, to document your care. Um, obviously I would expect the healthcare provider to continue to provide treatment, but, um, you know, it's I interesting new nuances that you don't, you know, you wouldn't project five or six years ago with, you know, how people were on paper and now the different type of environment that they're trying to function in, in a business world. We're almost out of time. Do you have time to stick around, all of you, in case some of the other folks Absolutely. that didn't get a chance to ask questions? Okay. Sure. Um, Want to uh, get each of you then to give me kind of a rapid fire final thought here. Um, if we got back together a year from now and talked about challenges and successes in data analytics, whatever, anything, what do you expect that uh, conversation to look like a year from now, Lori? Um, I, th I think from my perspective and, and at the SEC is it, it, it can't be a person, like nobody knows enough about all aspects. You know, I, I'm up here, I, I really don't know a lot about security. I don't know a lot about hardware or software. I'm a data person, I use data. I, I do analytics, but I have um, the right people around me to, and, and we all work together to build the right infrastructure to get the data, make it secure, but make it usable. For, for what we do, for our mission. Excellent, Stephen? Uh, for the purposes of your care, more health data is moving securely. Um, and the other thing that we focus on as well is, is that uh, patients have access to their health information. And so that's one of the biggest things that my office has been working to promote uh, relative to um, all of us playing an active role in our care and getting access to our data. So I think that's one thing that I would hope has you know, changed for the positive in a year from now. Audie, landmarks in a year out from now? Yeah, I, I work, I cover the whole federal sector, and I think that uh, a, a landmark a year out from now would be that while uh, I hope the, uh, I expect the operational flexibility focus will continue, I think a landmark will be the, the, uh, the growing appreciation for uh, technologies like software-defined storage and, its, and the inherent operational flexibility that brings with the inherent cybersecurity features and so forth, and the difference that can make in addressing uh, and providing operational flexibility that many of the agencies need. David? Uh, I actually don't think the conversation will change that much. I think although the tools might get more sophisticated and, and more complex, so will the threats. And, uh, is that a good thing? Well, <laughs> that, that, it gives me But the conversation security. won't change. Well, yeah. <laughs> but it, is it good, though? Because if, that, if that's the case, it doesn't sound like there will be tremendous new complexities added to the conversation either. Well, I think the, we all need to be aware of the trends mm -hmm. because the attackers are getting more sophisticated and we need to correspondingly become more, uh, more adept at avoiding the threats. Chuck? I, I think you're going to see a um, uh, continued explosion in the wearables and Internet of Things. I think that's going to grow. Um, whether it's you know, you're wearing a, a Fitbit or something and you're walking into your doctor and you're giving, yeah, I have one too, <laughs> um, giving that information to your doctor, whether it's your car, you know, turning on the lights as you get close to home or, you know, your refrigerator telling you you're out of milk. I, I think that is just going to compound the amount of data that's out there, whether it's secure, whether, you know, we can do good analytics on it, different questions, but I think the volume of data is just going to continue to grow. All right. I want to thank all of you for uh, participating in the panel today. A terrific discussion. Thank you for that. My thanks to the folks from Cloudera for inviting me to be a part of this. And thank you very much for coming and for paying attention to us. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.